Hello and welcome to my YouTube channel. My name is Alexey and today I have a special guest, Warren Sokol. Warren is a professional master engineer who worked with such musicians as Lana Del Rey, Imagine Dragons, Method Man, Public Enemy and many more. You can check out Warren's courses on mastering on ProMix Academy. If you want to expand your knowledge and develop your skills on mastering. If you are a producer like a Pro Academy student, you can check out Warren's Ultimate Guide to Mastering course. So by taking this course, you will get all the basic information about mastering. I'm so happy to have you Warren on my YouTube channel. It's a huge honor. Hey Alexi. So let's start our interview. My first question is how you became a master engineer um the way i kind of got into mastering engineer was kind of a slow build um i went to recording school um i went to the recording workshop in chillicothe ohio back in uh, 93 graduated high school in 93 i think it was actually spring of 94 when i actually went to the school um and uh after that basically i kind of went to that mainly because i was in a band um, and we had some label interest. We were doing a lot of good work. And uh, I was really curious about recording for myself and wanting to know what was going on when we were in a studio and everything. So my main purpose was just to kind of learn for myself. Um, as I was doing recording for my band, I also uh, ended up doing a lot of work for other bands and uh, as a lot of bands do, uh, my band fell apart, so I ended up doing a lot more recording for other people. And uh, um, in doing that, I was looking for ways that I could make what the stuff, the, my mixes, my recordings, the stuff that came out of my studio setup better than any others. You know what I mean? What can I do that's going to make mine a little better? And I had this concept that uh, if I was to get myself a mastering EQ and a mastering compressor, that everything that I put out can be mastered and sound better. Which, by the way, is not exactly accurate. It's, it's, it's kind of off base a little bit. But at the same time, getting those things, I started learning a lot about mastering and reading a lot and just learning and learning and learning and realizing that mastering kind of fit what I enjoyed doing. I, I really enjoyed that final product, you know, actually making the final production master. Um, sometimes a lot of artists will hear the song the first time as something that sounds finished and professional at a mastering session. And I enjoyed, I really enjoy, and still do enjoy, um, finalizing albums, where we're doing the spaces between songs and the arrangements of songs, and uh, getting to work on, on and this is, by the way, I didn't work on this, but getting to work on something like Dark Side of the Moon is a great, fun album mastering session, when everything kind of links together and you've got this overall view. There's not a lot of that kind of thing going on these days. Um, everything's really single-based at the moment. But that's all cyclical. It goes up in waves, comes and goes in waves. So um, I'm guessing the album will be back at some point. And uh, I do, I really enjoy that. And uh, that is really one of the things that kind of drew me in and made me want to be a mastering engineer, was being able to create the final thing that people get to hear. Most people don't hear the mix. They definitely don't get to hear the recorded tracks. Um, they get to hear that final production master, and I enjoy making that for people. And uh, it just kind of it it was something I was talented at right away. I just it was I'm good at recording and mixing. I can do a great record. I mean, <laughs> I can record great. I can mix great. But uh, mastering is just something that comes very naturally. So I went that direction. My second question is. What is the mastering in your opinion? Well, I guess I can answer that kind of in, in the opposite way first. Mastering is not EQing, compressing, or limiting a mix. Okay, that's processing. That's EQing, compressing, or limiting a mix. Um, mastering is the process of making a final production master, which in the past 20, 10 to 20 years has really focused on the EQing, compression, and limiting. So there's the mastering processing. And then there's the more tedious work that is really kind of mastering, which is making the final formats. Um, making sure that if you're exporting MP3s, 16-bit <clears throat> 24, or I'm sorry, 16-bit 44 waves, or 96K 32-bit waves, or a wave file that is the makeup of the entire first side of the album for vinyl cutting, that if I listen to all those different versions, 
that they retain a certain sound that's that's similar obviously an mp3 has more distortion and a vinyl has higher noise floor and plays back a little differently than something digital does but the sound remains the same and the sequencing and timings remain the same if i'm listening to an mp3 it needs to be the same time as the 24-bit 96k version um so you're also, with mastering programs, they allow you to not only do extreme editing, but they also allow you to export by PQ points, which are start and stop points, which don't have to be in the middle, or at the beginnings and ends of songs. They can be in the middle of music if you want. Um, let's say I've got a song that has an intro with people talking. Um, I can, in an album sense, the song tracks that blah, 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 blah. In an album sense, the track number can start right where the music starts. And the talking that's right before the song can be before the song starts. Um, it's kind of CD thinking. When you export something like that as WAV files, that talking that is happening in between songs on a CD would need to be connected to the end of the previous song. But anyway. Where I was going with that is a mastering program allows you to put in PQ points, where the songs start and stop, export based on those, and a lot of the good mastering programs now will let you create any bitrate or sample rate file from any bitrate or sample rate EDL, which is um, edit decision list, which is a fancy way of saying edit window for a mastering program. Um, so yeah, um, the master, mastering, is making a final production master. Um, and like I said, in the past 10 to 20 years, processing the mix has become a big part of that. But um, the actual point of mastering is to make final production masters that go out to all these different places that are all the correct length, you know, the same exact length. They start, they sound the same, named correctly, um, and they have the proper ISRC codes and or metadata if they need that. So that's really what mastering is, is creating a final production master. Every now and then, I'll see something on, on one of the web forums where people will re be referring to mastering in terms of the person doing it as some kind of master of something. And I've noticed that there are certain people that are attracted to doing it because that means they're a master of something. But, uh, and they may be. You might be a master at something. You might be a, be a master at mastering, but... The word mastering means that you're making a final production master. Wow, that's a lot of masters. My next question is, what is the main goal of mastering? Kind of the same thing, making that final production master. That's going to translate across different formats, different speakers. Um, obviously, if I'm listening on a speaker this big, it's not going to have the bass frequency response that a full range system that has a 12 inch or 18 inch woofer does. but a song should sound the same. It should have the same kind of impact, um, even if it may sound thinner. Um, but yeah, as far as the goal, it's really to take my main thing when I'm, I'm doing a project. Yeah, let's say this project already sounds good. My main goal is not to put my fingerprint all over it and manipulate things in different ways. Um, I'm usually trying to do as little as possible to make it sound not only as good as it can, but sound professional and finished, which in a lot of cases doesn't always require compression anymore because a lot of people use a lot of compression already. So um, it's whatever it needs. And, and what can I do that isn't gonna mess it up? When I'm doing processing, when I'm doing EQing or compression or limiting, I'm constantly bypassing it, not to see how good what I've done sounds, but to make sure that what I've done isn't mucking something else up. Um, I'll be by pipe. I'm doing any kind of high or mid frequency EQ. I'm always listening to what it's doing to the snare drum and vocal. If I bypass it, does the snare or vocal sound better? Even though I just brought up the high end, does it sound more brittle now with just that one instrument? Even though the cymbals might sound more springy and, and fresh, the snare drum sounds like it's going to eat your eyeballs because it's so harsh. So, um, so yeah, the main thing is is to make sure that, that what I'm doing isn't harming something else. Even before it's, it's enhancing or making something better, don't mess anything else up. Um, it's the main thing that's going to get you in trouble with clients is, is handing them something back. They just spent 12 months like focusing on this snare drum. You hand it back to them and it's all squished. And it doesn't matter if everything else sounds amazing, that snare drum just ruined their day. So. <laughs> My next question is, 
how people should prepare their mixes before sending them to a mastering engineer. Ten years ago, most guys, myself included, would recommend not putting any compression or limiting on a mix, but that has turned such a corner in the past ten years alone as far as people having compressors and EQs and limiters and all kinds of stuff all over the master fader when they start mixing. Um, and by the way, I know plenty of people that get a great result doing that. Myself, I've never gotten a great result doing that. Um, I'm just, I'm, it, if I've got a compressor acting on the master fader, what's the, com is that limiter that's on my snare drum sound like it actually sounds? And if it does that really matter if it ends up sounding good at the end. But myself, in order for me to control that individual snare drum or the vocal compressor, I can't have something on the master fader that's being triggered off of the kick drum that's messing those two things up. So I really, I, I don't prefer to mix into bus processing. Um, I think you're fighting yourself, or at least I'm fighting myself. Like I said, I, I've, I do mastering all the time for guys that work that way, and they get a great result. Um, myself, I just find myself constantly fighting myself and second-guessing myself as opposed to leaving that stuff alone until it's done. Build a great mix that sounds great, and then that master bus processing can enhance things and make them amazing, whereas they sounded great before, now it's like, wow, that's fucking amazing. Um, as far as preparing things, um, like I said, in back in the old day, we might tell you to remove compressors or limiters, but if you've had a compressor there since before you started mixing, like when you're tracking vocals on your master fader, um, it's, it's gonna change the mix way too much to have you uh, remove it. I do prefer to not have a limiter on the mix. Um, peak limiters, modern digital peak limiters, basically rewrite the waveform on the output. You know, you set your threshold, and it's never, it's that ceiling. It's never going to go over 0 0.0 minus 0 0.01 or digital zero or whatever you have it set to. In order to do that, especially if you're pushing that thing, um, it, it rewrites the waveform. It's a look ahead limiter. It sees what's coming and says, oh, this peak's going to go over zero, so let's rewrite it lower. Um, so anyway, my point is, is there's a limiter on your mix and it's doing any work subsequent processing, if you're going to try to EQ it or compress it or whatever you're going to do to it, generally just makes things sound more distorted. Um, as technology increases, things like that become less and less of an issue. But if, if something's been limited already, it's really hard to make it sound like it's got any life left um, or to do any additional processing to that track that isn't just going to add more distortion. So sound-wise, I prefer no limiter on a mix. If there's one on there and that's the only source we have to work with, it can be worked with, but I would prefer to have no limiter. Um, and uh, keeping the bus processing to a, a, a reasonable amount is also a good idea, but uh, at the same time, that's the artistry, so have at it as far as that's concerned. There's a technical thing with a limiter where it makes additional processing sound bad, so um, I do prefer not having a limiter. Now, on to the more important things. Making sure that your files are named correctly and that you've actually listened to them and checked them out and made sure they're the right version before you send them to somebody to spend an hour or so working on to get sent back and find out that you sent them the wrong version. Um, a lot of people end up doing a lot of different versions of a mix nowadays. Make sure you name it something that makes sense and that's gonna make sense to somebody else and it's gonna make sense to you if you have to find it four months from now. Um, if somebody says, you know, if you, if you, the song is called, you know, rock and roll and we've got the rock and roll awesome mix and the rock and roll bass mix and the rock and roll wow mix, you know, those don't mean anything if you go try to find them in a month from now. They might mean something really big when you're writing that. But you send that to somebody who's never been involved with the session and they don't know what that means, you know what I mean? They're gonna, myself, I generally chop all that stuff off and name the song SRC for source, meaning it's my source mix. Um, it's just for my own file management. But naming your mixes something as you're ex exporting them, that's gonna make sense if you have to look at it four months or six months or a year from now. So that same song, rather than calling it rock and roll, you know, spectacular mix, we can call it rock and roll, you know, January 2021 export. It's boring, right? Boring. But when you go to try to find which mix did I do, you know, last Friday night at, you know, the third one that I put out, 
Um, generally files that are saved are gonna have a time when they were created, so you can find the time, find the earliest one. Um, or you can also, you know, just as long as you recognize it, put the date on there so you know which one you got. Um, once you know you got the right files, throw them into your DAW before sending them to a mastering engineer and make sure they're the right versions. Listen to them. Um, make sure that one of them isn't limited. That happens a lot where I'll get a group of, you know, eight to ten songs and all of them are mixes. Clearly, they're not limited. They've got waveform movement. And then one of them looks like a loaf of bread. Sometimes that's intentional. Sometimes it's the only version the artist or uh, producer had. And other times they just sent the wrong mix. Um, so whenever I see that, I gotta call up and ask, you know, is this the correct mix for sure? Um, but yeah, making sure that you're sending the correct ones. Um, and then uh, along those same lines, a lot of times when somebody's making a final export of a mix, they've kind of they're kind of at checkout point. They've been working on this thing, you know, at very least for hours and maybe weeks and days and weeks or months. And now I'm hitting that final mix button. I'm gonna export it. Ah, I'm done. Well, unfortunately, you need to make sure that what you're exporting isn't gonna chop off the beginning or the end a little bit. Um, I get tracks all the time, literally all the time, that sound like they faded out completely. But once we apply any mastering processing and start bringing out details or maybe pump the level up by six to eight dB if necessary, what sounded like it used to fade out now fades out and then chops off abruptly. Um, and that usually has to do with um, reverb plugins and where you set the end of your export selection. Um, you got to crank up your, your speakers uh, as the reverb tails trailing out at the end of a song um, and make sure that you're given enough time to fully dissipate. Because um, once you turn it up by you know, 8 to 10 dB sometimes, maybe not that much, um, that, that tail is, gets a lot, it becomes much 8 to 10 dB louder, so you're going to hear it if it chopped off. So that happens a lot. So it's a good thing to check your, your make sure your tail is, is fully um, trailed off and into silence before ending an export. Um, the same thing can happen at the beginning of a song. If you're using MIDI, if you're doing things with MIDI, it's always a good idea to leave an empty measure. So measure one is silence. Your downbeat for the song starts on measure two. That gives you uh, silence before the beginning of the song. That way when you go to export, you're not chopping off the beginning of a, of a sound wave because it was right at the beginning of that downbeat of the wave file. Give it an empty measure. Um, if you're not working with MIDI or bars and beats type editing, give it a second before the song starts, give it a second or two before the song ends as your export selection. All that stuff's extremely easy to trim off, and uh, we're more than likely gonna be needing to do some kind of trimming or fading to master files anyway. Um, so leave extra space there. Don't uh, chop that stuff off, because after the processing has been done and the loudness levels have been brought up, those things can cause problems, and the fade out especially is, it generally what you gotta do is follow it with a fade that, that sounds like it faded out correctly, which in a lot of cases ends up sounding like a fade as far as something natural. Um, the beginning's not as easy to fix. There are ways of fixing something that was, it was chopped off in the beginning, but it's not as, not as easy and generally is a compromise of some kind. It's so much easier just to make sure that there's a second before any music starts. <laughs> um, so yeah, those are my main things as far as, as prepping files. Make sure you got the right file, name it something that's gonna make sense to somebody who's never seen it. Make sure the ends and beginnings aren't chopped off. Um, it's best not to put any extreme peak limiting on a mix before sending it to mastering because that affects the sound waves in a technical way that additional processing usually distorts. Okay? My next question is, analog mastering versus digital mastering, what is the main difference about the sound? My attitude towards this has been changing a lot lately. Um, not only because I'm setting up a new studio and uh, digital gear is exponentially more or I'm sorry, ex exponentially less expensive than analog gear. But digital stuff has got to a point where if you're able, if you're running a computer where you can run it on its like extreme settings, um, for example, I have a digital EQ, the DMG Equilibrium. Um, it is amazing sounding EQ. It sounds absolutely excellent. I love it for a lot of different stuff. When I'm on a computer where I can run it on its high settings. If I have it at its, its highest uh, buffer setting, um, 
it's amazing what it does to the bass and the way the filters work. It, it's I just haven't heard anything else that's this clean and accurate before, but. I've tried to run it on a lab, my laptop before and it just didn't have the juice. I couldn't turn it up to even half of the, the power that it took to get the really great sound out of it. It still was a great EQ, but it wasn't what I was used to um, on my studio computer when I tried to run it on my laptop. Um, anyway, my point being that I can do almost anything I can do analog, I can do in the digital world now. There are a few caveats to that. Um, equalization, I, I could totally get away with never having an analog EQ again if I needed to. There are certain sound characteristics and texture characteristics that still exist in the analog world that don't exist in the digital world. But as far as mastering is concerned, in a lot of cases, what I'm trying to do is not add a bunch of textures and stuff. So I'm trying to use cleaner, more accurate processors. Um, and at least in the EQ realm. Um, limiting when it comes to like loudness maximization type stuff, uh, I do that pretty much exclusively in the digital realm now. Um, I've tried analog peak limiters before. There's a couple out there that, that do kind of a good job, but the, the, the way that they sound squashed compared to how it might sound squashed using a digital peak limiter um, is just 100 times worse. You can totally hear it working. And of course you can, because you're trying to deal with milliseconds worth of transients, and anything in the analog world always has to respond. Unless it's digitally controlled, I have not seen an analog, a digitally controlled analog peak limiter yet. Um, I could be wrong, let me know if I am. But I have not seen an analog, di digitally controlled analog peak limiter, which would allow you to have, he still wouldn't because the analog path wouldn't let you delay it. So, sorry, I'm, I'm now thinking in my head, but, the reason a digital peak limiter lets you get level without changing the sound extremely is because it has a look-ahead circuit that sees what's coming. So as this transient's coming, it's turning it down. It's doing that. Any kind of analog device can't do that. Um, the analog world can't really look ahead. It's it's in it's it's it's, it's locked into the three-dimensional time and space continuum and can't move ahead in time. Um, so any analog device is responding to a transient. So here's my threshold, it goes over it and then I bring it down and that always sounds audible. So any analog limiters I haven't, I haven't liked yet. Um, I'm open to uh, suggestions, but I haven't heard one that I liked yet. So that's, I do that almost exclusively digitally. EQ I can totally do digitally. If I never was able to use an analog EQ again, I could still work. Um, when it comes to compression, I'm sort of divided on that. There are some plug-in compressors that I really like, but as far as, as in mastering, the more often than not, I'm doing the teeniest, tiniest little bit of compression um, to where the needle's just moving. And I've got very low ratios, very slow attack and release times, and it's just kind of making things hover a little bit and, and, and you know, kind of leveling. Um, I don't even know how to explain it because it, it sounds like it's doing nothing, but it brings out all of this detail and punch. Or, or allows you to control it. Um, there are some great plug-in compressors that I can do that with. It just seems like it takes me a lot longer to set up a plug-in compressor to get exactly what I want out of it compared to an analog compressor. Um, one of the compressors, analog compressors that I had in, in my last studio at United and in the studio I worked at at Universal Mastering was the Dave Hill Titan compressor, which technically wasn't designed as a mastering compressor. But, um, it's a digitally controlled analog compressor, so it has a digital side chain, which allows it to do some stuff that's kind of interesting, and it's just extremely accurate. Like most of his gear, it's extremely accurate. Um, and, and then there's a couple knobs on there that add a couple of fancy things, because once again, because of the digital side chain, there's a, a dynamic expansion thing, so as the more I compress, it's actually adding, or at least allowing the transient to go through a little more before it goes into compression, even though the attack time's not changing. And it just, if you do have to push compression, it's this, like, bring the life back switch, um, which is, is pretty amazing. Uh, so anyway, um, that was something that was in the analog world, but it was digitally controlled. I really, really, really liked it. There's a couple other plug-in, like the Weiss DS1 plug-in is something I have. That's not 
a compressor I'm gonna go to um, because something, I wanna make something sound good and have character. That's a tool, the DS-1's a tool. Um, it's a Swiss army knife of a tool, but if there's a problem, if I got a vocal that's wasn't compressed even though the rest of the mix was and it just keeps on jumping out of the mix, I can go in with the Weiss, set up its frequency characteristics and the compression characteristic to tuck that vocal in there and make it sound like it was always that way. But I'm not really relying on the, the Weiss to go get a, you know, go get a tone or, or kind of shape the sound of a mix. It's, it's a fix-it tool, at least in my opinion. Um, there's a plug-in version of, of uh, uh, I forget his name, there's a guy from Capital, um, Ian, I think is his name that built a compressor called the Magic Death Eye Compressor. That is a, it's a very Mu compressor, um, variable Mu compressor, like the Manly variable Mu. And uh, it has an um, unbelievable sound. It's a great, and there's a plug-in version of it that sounds amazing. Um, and, and the reason I may, I, oh, it sounds amazing. I have yet to hear a tube compressor, a variable Mu compressor that sounded like a variable Mu compressor. It does, like, they tend to kind of hug the sound together. I haven't heard one a digital recreation of one that sounded a like it had tubes in it or b like it was using tubes to do compression, um, except for the Magic Death Eye plugin. Um, it's it's fairly cheap and it sounds absolutely amazing. Uh, that said, I do kind of prefer analog compression still. It has something that's a little less hands on. Um, I, I seem to spend more time setting up a plug-in compressor than I would with an analog compressor, and I don't know if that's a visual thing where I'm, I'm you know, able to dial these these knobs in to within percentages of a dB or percentages of whatever setting it is. Where in the analog world, a lot of times I'll grab the knobs and I'll just be listening, you know, turning the knob, looking past the speakers at the sound. Uh, where digitally, I'm I'm looking at the screen a little too much, you know, um, and that goes with any digital gear, and I guess that just is what it is, but um, technically if I had to get away with digital compression, I could do that. The thing I can't get away with in the uh, digital world that I, I can do, uh, one second here. Sorry about that. <laughs> I guess that's an edit. Um, the one thing that I, I can't do in the digital world that I can do in the analog world is play with gain. Um, harmonics and gain, there's a lot of digital harmonic processors, but what I can do with an analog EQ, something like the Massive Passive, that might be a, a passive EQ with tube output amps. Um, this is something I've done for years in both of the studios I've worked at. Um, with a mastering console that has you know input and output gain, so you can kind of drive gain in if you need, or decrease it if you need if it's too loud. Same with the output before and after the inserted gear, and just driving analog gain into one device. Um, you know, coming digitally out into my converter, the converter goes into the console. I have like something like the massive passive inserted. And then I'll take the input gains and just start cranking them up and driving gain into the massive passive. And then you're driving the, you're driving the, the tubes, you're driving the input circuit. Um, the way different impedances of different gear stacked in a particular order gives you the shape. And uh, that's something I'm not able to do digitally yet, is manipulate gain and get a good result. Doing that stuff tends to give me beef and body without changing the mix in a lot of cases. And I'm not talking about increasing by like 6 dB. I'm talking about a dB, half dB, one and a half or two at the most. You know what I mean? I'm not talking about completely cranking it into a piece of gear. I'm talking about driving it just a little more than it was to begin with. And we're doing it with analog circuitry. Um, difference being the digital world, as great as it is these, time, these years or these days, as good as digital is these days, it's still just a calculator. Um, there is real processing going on, but it's calculations. When I increase gain by a half dB or one dB with some kind of digital thing and try to drive it into another, with a plug-in and try to drive it into another plug-in, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. It doesn't hit that magic spot. There is no magic spot. We're just a calculator, and if there is some kind of magic spot, it was programmed in 
those just don't feel right. So driving gain to get both detail and harmonic enhancement and level um, without really changing a mix is something I have not been able to do digitally yet. Other than that, I really don't have a dog in the fight. I like analog stuff, I like digital stuff. There's drawbacks to digital stuff. There's drawbacks to analog stuff. So uh, I'm a big fan of the uh, anal digitally controlled analog stuff, like the Dave Hill Titan compressor, where you have a digital sidechain that's able to be extremely accurate and add a couple of fancy features that other compressors don't have. But if I don't want to use those extra features, it's just extremely accurate and clean. Um, I really like that kind of thing where we have digitally controlled analog signal path. Um, so that way you're not using the calculator. On this audio, you're only using the calculator to control the audio. It's a big thing. Um, but as far as digital and analog, uh, I'm just looking for what works. They're tools. Um, I, before I was working at Universal Mastering where we had access to all kinds of gear. People were always bringing gear to demo. Um, I had a gear list. I was always interested in checking out the new gear and all that. While I worked there, I got to try so many pieces of, of different pieces of analog and digital and plugins and just everything. I was able to try so much stuff, I realized, and I hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but I didn't like most of it. Um, I don't need a million pieces of gear. I don't need 10,000 options. I need the 10 or 20 options at the most. I usually don't need 10 or 20 options, but I need the, the, the options that matter. I need stuff that sounds great. I don't need gimmicks and lights and funny names and fancy face plates. What I need is a tool that works when I need it to work, right? Um, I know that might be kind of boring and old mannish, but I just don't care about the gear list anymore. What I want is a tool that does the job I want it to do without having to spend 20 minutes to get it to sound right. Um, so yeah, when it comes to analog and digi digital, um, I don't have a dog in that fight. I want them both to be great. <laughs> Give me the best of everything. <laughs> My next question is, can you master a track on a high commercial level by using plugins only? Basically, the question is, can you make a professional sounding master with plugins only? And the answer is absolutely yes. Um, especially if you're starting from a great mix that already sounds absolutely amazing, or at very least exactly the way the client wants. You know, which by the way isn't always technically amazing. Um, so yeah, uh, you can absolutely make an excellent master with plugins, 100%. And once again, if you got a great mix. If you got a really, really great mix, you may want to, you may need to like boost the high end a little to make it, you know, a little more transparent. You might need to do a couple of dips to, to, to make things a little cleaner and have some more detail. But if you got a great mix, you might be able to get away with just a teeny tiny little bit of EQ and some limiting. You can absolutely do that with plugins. Um, you can also go to town making a million changes with plugins. Either way, you can make a great master with plugins. There's, there's no reason why you couldn't. You know what nobody ever said? Nobody has ever said, man, that song would have been a hit if we only used an analog EQ. Nobody's ever said that because nobody's listening to this. Nobody who's listening to the song after a song's been released has any idea about the production unless they're a nerd and they go back and read about that stuff, which I'm sure we all do. But as far as, as the people actually buying music to listen to music, um, who aren't engineers. None of them care what EQ you used. They don't care if it was analog or digital. They just care if the song makes them feel warm inside when they listen to it or gets their, their blood, blood pumping. So yes, you can absolutely make a professional master with plugins. There's absolutely no reason why that wouldn't work. My next question is, should you master according to LUFS only? Or you can break the rules. There are no really, really no rules in music. However, if you're working in the mastering field, you do have to adhere to some rules because your job is to make the final production master, which needs to adhere to some format rules, right? However, LUFS levels are not a way to level up songs out. You don't pick a number and try to master to that. You make things sound great. And these, the streaming platforms are going to take care of that. Um, for instance, Spotify. They, their levels are minus 14, right? They, they normalize to a level of minus 14. Um, most music, if you were to master it, let's say, actually, let me put that another way. Most modern, like, rock and hip-hop and stuff, if you were to master that to a, a level of minus 14, 
it's more than likely gonna sound kind of wimpy compared to everything else. It's it just kind of how it is um, these days. Now, by the way, there's a thin line between sounding a little wimpy because it's too quiet and sounding like shit because it's too loud. <laughs> All right, so there's a thin line there and you gotta play that. It's gonna be different for every mix. There's no, that's why you can't pick a number either. Um, every, the, how loud you can push a mix without getting diminishing returns, distortion and bad artifacts is gonna depend on the mix. Um, there is you no, know, there's a lot of amazing tools these days, but they're not gonna be able to squeeze blood out of a stone. So if I've got a mix that's been compressed to death uh, I can only make it so, there's only so much, much density I can slam together into that wave file before all bits are just all lit up all the time and working. Um, by the way, that's not technically how it works, but it's a good way to think about it. <laughs> so anyway, as far as LUFS levels, um, I don't know a single professional mastering engineer, and I'm talking about like the guys that are, are mastering the music that are, are winning Grammys and stuff like that. I don't know a single one who picks an LUFS number and tries to reach that. Um, when, when you're dealing with something like Spotify, their app has loudness normalization. Um, and the reason it's doing that is so that things play back at the same level. It isn't to change the sound. If here's minus 14, and if I have something that's minus 10 and it's 4 dB louder, they don't sit there and compress it, limit it, and bring it down. They just lower the volume. Same as your volume knob, you know what I mean? Or turning down your master fader. It's not affecting your dynamics, it's not changing the sound. The thing that's changing the sound is the codec. They're going to be converting your wave file to their codec as well, which can affect the sound. But um, dynamically, they're not gonna change the sound when they turn it down. So if I make something that sounds great at an LUFS of, of eight, when it gets to Spotify, they're just gonna turn it down by six dB. Um, the overall volume. If I was to then turn my speaker control up by 60 feet, it's gonna sound the same. Um, so there's no reason to try to meet their dynamic range. The one caveat, to, I shouldn't say the one caveat, but the caveat to that is if you're lower. Let's say I made a mix that was at minus 16. Um, Spotify is gonna bring it up, turn the volume up to minus 14, which is their standard level, right? But um, when they have to turn the level up, you might be at a LUFS, like a loudness level of minus four or minus 16, but you might have a peak level of that's still minus 0 0.01. So if they turn it up by two dB, you're gonna be clipping by two dB. So they do employ a limiter if they have to turn your mix up. So basically the only time to master to a LUFS of, four, of 14 to match Spotify, I'm sorry, it's not to match Spotify. The only reason to really do that is if the project you're working on sounds fucking amazing when it's mastered to LUFS 14 or it happens to be there when you're done with it. Um, those things are a gauge. And uh, as far as them being a gauge, you can't really, an LUFS meter is not a real time meter. It's a measurement of the beginning of the song to the end of the song. Um, so trying to master to any specific level doesn't work. Let me give you an example. Let's we'll say we've got an album, okay? And I've got two songs that are loud as hell, right? They're, uh, they're, I'm not gonna give you an LUFS level because that's not gonna make any difference here in a minute. Let's say I've got one song that's super loud. You know what I mean? It's really loud, it's jamming, it's a rock and roll song. It's just and they're loud as hell and jamming. Um, and then, and so I've got three songs like that. And then I've got this other song that's extremely quiet from the beginning to about two minutes in. It's just this slow, quiet thing, all right? And then it builds up, and the last 30 seconds, it's just all out rocking. Um, like a Metallica power ballad, they all do that. <laughs> they start out quiet and then erupt. Um, because of that, you're gonna have an LUFS level that's lower than the other two really, really rocking songs that are loud the whole time, your LUFS is gonna be lower. Even if that end part of, of the song that starts out quiet, even if it's technically 6 dB louder than the loud songs on that album. Okay, just once again, just as an example. I've got two songs that are super loud, I've got another one that's quiet for two minutes, and then it's even louder than those other songs for the last 30 seconds. So technically, if you looked at it, that on a peak meter or an RMS meter, during the loud parts, this one's gonna be, you know, that one's gonna be really loud if you're listening during that end part. 
but an LUFS meter is meant to be read from the beginning of the song to the end of the song. So it's the average of the whole song, and if I have a song that's quiet for two minutes and then has 30 seconds of loudness, I'm gonna have an extremely low LUFS, especially compared to something that's loud the whole time. Um, so because of that, LUFS numbers are really only a gauge. Um, by the way, Spotify doesn't technically use LUFS numbers. They use a thing called replay gain. And what that, it basically works in the same kind of concept. But one thing that replay gain does is allow it to set the loudness for the entire record. So you have your LUFS level for the songs per song and replay gain is going to average those levels to get the average for the whole album. That way quiet songs are still quiet, loud songs are still loud. They don't adjust them individually. It adjusts the entire album up or down. Um, but anyway, no, it's not a good idea to master the numbers unless you're getting a good result that way. I don't see why not, but, uh, I don't, like I said, I don't know a single engineer who's, who's doing like Grammy level records or, you know, albums that are being heard by millions of people who's, who's worried about LUFSs and it, basically when I'm working and I'm done kind of processing a song, it sounds the way I want it. It's as loud as I want it and I'm gonna record that mastered version into a new WAV file, that's when I'll zero out my LUFS meter as it records in. And when it's done, I'll kind of reference it, oh, it's an LUFS of this. And that'll be something that's in my mind as I'm leveling out the rec rec record and gauging its, its uh, loudness levels throughout the songs. Um, but it's not something that I'm using to zero in on some target. Um, as I say that, I realize that there's a lot of guys out there who've, who've who we call it a target level and, and infer penalties if you're not meeting some level. There's no penalty. They turn the volume down. Once again, if you were to turn your speaker level up by the same amount that any streaming service turns the level down, it should sound the same. Going up, that might not be the same because depending on your peak level, it may have to employ a limiter. So it's always better to err on the side of louder, which kind of fits what people are wanting these days anyway. Um, I hope that makes sense. Um, it's kind of a kind of a weird concept, and the way that the LUFS reader or does its readings, um, if you don't realize that it's an average of the song from beginning to end, you can get really screwy levels to begin with. <laughs> All right, what's next? My next question is, what advice can you give about mastering workflow? Something that really affected how I worked was getting a monitor controller that allowed me to match levels. Um, the one that I was using, there's a number of them that do it nowadays, but the one that I was using when that first kind of that light went on in my head was the Crane Song Avocet. Um, it allows you, it has three analog inputs, three digital inputs, and as you select your inputs, you can then hold the input down for a second, and the volume knob now adjusts its input offset. So as I'm working, I've got our source mix and our master, and as we're working, the master keeps getting louder, right? And then I'm comparing A and B and seeing what I've, you know, what does the mix sound like? What does the master sound like? If that master is always louder, it tends to always sound better. Um, that's the way your brain works with the Fletcher Munson curve. The louder it gets, you start to hear more bass and more detail. And pretty much in short term uh, comparisons, louder is always going to sound better in general. Um, so what the Avocet allowed me to do, and a lot of monitor controllers will allow you to do now, is as I'm listening and I'm comparing my source to my master and the master gets louder, I can now click on the source and turn it up again. And then the master gets a little louder, and now I can turn it up. And so when I'm A, Bing them, I'm actually A, Bing them at equal level. It takes a lot of the guesswork out of what you're doing. Um, and sometimes you can be surprised at how much EQ or something you can do. Uh, and it doesn't seem like you're doing as much as you thought you were when you're listening to it at an equal level, or vice versa. You might be drowning in, in, <laughs> in EQ, um, trying to make up for the differences that you're hearing because things are at different levels. So one workflow thing I really advise is to figure out a way to get your source mix and the master you're working on a bead at the same level. Pretty much if you're working in a DAW, you can kind of do that with the, with the channel faders. But you gotta go with the you gotta go the other direction. You gotta keep turning the master down, which leaves room for an error. You know what I mean? If once again, if I'm mixing, or I'm sorry, if I'm mastering a track and here's my source mix of my master, and I keep making that master louder, I can always go into the DAW fader and just turn it down. It's the same thing that the, uh, the streaming sites would do. It's not gonna affect your dynamic range. 
you're turning the output fader post mastering processing. So it's just a volume fader. Turning that down so that I'm listening at equal level. That's kind of backwards, unfortunately. Um, the reason you can't turn the source up in that example is because at a certain point it's going to start clipping. Uh, a lot of times the source mix someone gives you is, you know, a dB or 2 dB below zero, below digital zero, or right at digital zero. It's clipping, or I'm sorry, peaking right at digital zero. And if I was to, you know, bring my master up by 2 dB and bring my source up, now my source is clipping and I'm not going to be hearing the same thing again. So if you're doing it digitally within a DAW, you can't keep bringing the mix up. You got to bring the source, or I'm sorry, the master down to get them equal level for better comparisons. Um, when you do that, you can't forget to put that fader back up if it's going to affect your export. Depending on the DAW you're using, you can have a channel fader turned down and have it not affect your export or turn your export down by 6 dB, <laughs> which I've done. Um, I've, I've sent a couple of masters out that were 12 dB quieter than they were supposed to be. And uh, when the client called back, hey, what's up with these? These are really quiet. I'm going, what did I do here? What's wrong? And the meters are all looking right because they're being fed before my channel fader. And uh, it took me a few minutes to, to notice that my channel fader had been turned down by like 10 dB. So uh, I exported it that way. So it's something you got to be careful with, but that's easy to fix. You're better off listening at equal level like that if you have to, um, as opposed to not having equal level. And uh, it's a lot easier to overdo the processing when you're not listening at equal level. All right, so that's my main workflow thing. And what I was saying before about file naming. Name it something that makes sense, please. All right. Uh... My next question is, in what room should you master? What headphones and speakers should you have? Uh, I can't recommend what headphones and speakers you should have because that's usually a pretty personal thing and it also depends on the room you're in. Um, so as far as the room you're in, Ideally, you would want a room that's, you know, like 26 to 30 feet long. I think I forget the numbers now. Anyway, you want it long and wide so that sound waves have room to fully propagate. Um, for those nerds out there who uh, know how long a, a 30 hertz waveform is, um, at 30 hertz, one cycle, one positive negative cycle gets close to 20 feet long, 10 feet long. I'm forgetting off the top of my head. Um, but I think at 20 hertz, it's 30 feet. So I think a 20 hertz waveform is roughly 30 feet long to propagate once. It might, it might be twice. I'm, I'm forgetting my acoustics math at the moment. Um, but basically, ideally, what you want is a room long enough for the bass frequencies that you will be listening to to fully propagate without bouncing off that back wall and causing an echo, which is always going to start causing um, room modes. So uh, that's number one, a room that's big enough to fully propagate waveforms. Walls that are wide enough on the sides that you're not getting these direct reflections that come out of the speaker, hit the wall and come right back at your ear. Um, and then you start working on the... Uh, those points, those first reflection points, um, and, and taming down. You don't want a dead room. No point in a dead room. Nobody listens to music in a dead room. Um, you want it to have absorption and diffusion so that you're breaking up some frequencies and letting them be absorbed easier. But it's usually, this is being, by the way, a, a extreme generalization, but it usually need, you need to control those first reflections. The first one to three reflections are the ones that are going to be loud enough to really affect what you're hearing coming out of the speakers and messing with it. Um, man, I'm kind of talking like if you're kind of doing it yourself, the main thing you're worried about is those first reflections. And uh, an easy way to kind of see that, like where is the first reflection gonna happen? So the poor man's acoustician is you get a, like a two foot by two foot mirror and you sit in your mixing spot with your speakers in front of you and you have your buddy take that mirror and walk along the wall. And anywhere you can see the speaker directly is a first reflection point because light waves and sound waves are going to travel the same. So if I can see the speaker on that wall out of a mirror, I've got a reflection that's coming directly there. Now, there's a lot more to it than that. Um, but 
if you're on a budget and doing it yourself at those first reflection points where you can see the speaker in a mirror on the wall from your mix position, um, you control those points with some absorption and diffusion if needed. Back wall, absorption, quite a bit of diffusion. Um, you can get a really nicely controlled room sometimes. Um, there's a little bit more to it than that, but those are your basic ideas. As far as what room you should master in, you should master in a room that's controlled so that you know what you're listening to. Um, I get tons and tons of mixes that have, usually where I hear it is in the bass, bass problems. Um, whether they have no bass in the mix they sent me, even though it's a hip hop song that's supposed to have this driving low, 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 th low thump going, but they had a subwoofer hooked up to their system that was cranked up so much that they were hearing the sub. I'm thinking of a particular example where it was like 20 dB louder than reality. So what was playing out of their DAW had a lot of bass. And then it was going into a speaker system that had a subwoofer that was turned up 20 dB louder than it was supposed to be. So they kept turning the bass down in the mix. The opposite of that can happen too. Somebody mixing on tiny little speakers and they want big low end. They can't physically hear it out of the sp those tiny speakers. What they're hearing is harmonics of that bass that can actually pass through that tiny little speaker and distortion that the bass is causing in that tiny speaker. So they keep cranking it up, cranking it up, and then it gets to a speaker system that actually has like a nine to 12 inch woofer and you're just being blown out the back of the wall with the bass amount. So working on a system that you, um, even if you can't, if you don't have the budget or the room itself to make it accurate, make it as accurate as you can and get to know it. Listen to a ton of music, not just your favorite music. Listen to a ton of music, acoustic stuff, hip hop stuff, jazz stuff, rock stuff, country stuff, and get this average of what sounds right um, and get to know your system so that you're not guessing at what's coming out of it. Um, when it comes to mastering, you're doing usually subtle stuff. So you need to have a certain amount of control in the room so that you can hear subtle things being done. Um, as far as what speakers and what headphones, that is so based on a person's opinion. Um, what I've been working on for the past, shit, what has it been? Almost 15 years now, has been Lipinski L707s. Um, and I've had, they're a, a it has two seven inch woofers and a tweeter in the middle, so it kind of stands vertically. Um, I've used a couple of different subwoofers with them, and when I say subwoofers, I mean two. One for the left, one for the right. Um, if you're using a single subwoofer, you should consider getting two and making a full range system as opposed to bass that's mono. Um, believe it or not, two subwoofers are actually easier to set up and control in a room than one, because you have less gain coming out of them, less distortion, and the way that the two sound waves propagate through a room as opposed to one, one you're always gonna get an echo, bam. If you got two of them, you have a, a more diffused field and less volume. Um, once again, I'm getting into the technical woods there, uh, so I don't wanna go too far into that. But in general, a single subwoofer can cause problems that dual subwoofers can actually make easier to solve. Um, and then and when you're doing that, what you're doing is you have a speaker on the right and you're aligning the subwoofer with it so that you've got a single full range speaker. Same thing with the left. You have the right, left speaker, left sub, and I'm gonna align those so I've got a full range system. Not speakers in a boom box, you know what I mean? That's gonna, that, that you can just, you know, I have a feeling in my gut. Well, if you're doing mastering and you can feel the bass in your gut on every song, something's wrong with your subwoofer. So, um, as far as what speakers, I don't, I don't know what to recommend, but I, I recommend something good and accurate um, you generally want to try to get bass down to at least 30 and preferably 20 hertz accurately. Um, and there's a lot of guys using headphones these days, but I just can't jump on that wagon. I don't like the way headphones sound. I never have. Um, there's the, the sound field isn't there. And, and when I'm listening, I'm listening through the sound. I'm not just hearing like this vocal that's in front of me. And... You know, the guitar that might be here and here and some drums, you know, well, like I'm, I'm explaining what I'm hearing, is those layers of sound and what's going on in between the sounds. Um, the details lie in between the stuff that's easy to hear. You can always hear that vocal out front, but its reverb is what gives it direction and space, whether it's left to right or depth. Um, the panning and reverb tie those two things together, or more importantly, how it was recorded with a microphone. Um, but I don't get that out of headphones. Um, it's an over-detailed, over-stimulating thing. I just, I don't, I don't like it. And I can't hear any bass. 
And I don't want a sub pack. That's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard. You can edit that out, Alexi. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, so yeah, I hope that covers that. I don't know what speakers to tell you to get other than something that's accurate um, and has bass that goes down to at least 30 hertz accurately, preferably down to at like 20 hertz accurately. My next question is, what are the best mastering plugins according to your experience? For EQ, I really, really like the DMG Equilibrium. Um, it's, I think it's hands down probably the most powerful and best sounding EQ I've ever used. Um, as far as it being accurate and tight and just doing the EQ it's supposed to do and not adding a bunch of artifacts and crap to it. Um, um, so I really, really like that. Um, when it comes to plugins and stuff, as far as compression, once again, the Weiss DS1 from SoftTube is an excellent, excellent compressor, and the Weiss DSer um, from SoftTube is actually the same algorithm with a user interface that has been designed specifically for the DSing part of it, and it gives you two bands instead of one, and uh, once again, probably one of the best DSers I've ever used. Um, other compressors, I, like I said before, I really like the Magic Death Eye compressor. Uh, the analog version is great as well. Um, I'm a big fan of PSP plugins. They have a uh, compressor plugin that it's it's been around a long time now, but it's called Master Comp. And uh, if you're running it in its high sample rate mode, um, I think that they I forget what the acronym is for, but FAT. It will switch. You turn the fat switch on, and it, it goes into an upsampling mode where it's working at, a, at an up with an upsampler, and it just sounds amazing to me. I still really really like that. Um, I've just recently started playing with some around with some of the UAD, like the Alicia UAD version of the Alicia compressor and the Weiss 2500. I'm sorry, API 2500, not the Weiss. Um, but I haven't used those enough yet to really have a, a solid opinion on them. Um, as far as limiters go, I love the PSP limiter. Um, it's still one of the more transparent ones that I've used. Um, I do use the ozone limiter quite a bit, but it's usually when I want it to add kind of a biting kind of a sound. If I'm looking for something to be transparent, I'm usually not going for the ozone limiter. Um, I don't really use any of the other pieces in ozone. I have used the dynamic EQ when that was necessary, but that's like once a year when that's actually necessary. But, uh, but yeah, I, I do like their limiter, and but I'm using it when I'm wanting to put kind of a tight edge on something as opposed to not making it sound like I did anything. Um, for that, I do prefer the PSP limiter. Um, the Weiss MM1, once again, from SoftTube, um, it's a peak limiter. Once again, kind of based on the algorithm of the DS1, but it's, it's just the peak rhythm, uh, peak limiting section, and it's been enhanced with some stuff. Um, I like that too, but I feel like I can only push it by a little bit. I, I can't push it. You can only be like a dB, maybe 2 dB at the very most, and I can really hear it working. Um, but I really like that too. Um, as far as other plugins, uh, I would have to kind of start digging through them and seeing what I got and what I use. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, once again, I did mention the Weiss DSer. DS1 compressor and their limiter. They've also released, uh, SoftTube has also released a version of the Weiss EQ now. Um, has a VST plugin that's really great as well. Um, so yeah, a lot of that stuff. Um, as far as other plugins, um, that's hard to, I, I'm not sure because those are the ones that I use the most in mastering anyway. And my final question is, how should you master an album? So, um, Alexi and I had had a discussion, and I had mentioned, uh, or he had mentioned that he saw in one of the Produce Like a Pro videos that I had mentioned that if I was producing this song or mastering a particular song in an album context, I would do it a little differently. And um, basically what, what I mean by that is mastering a single versus mastering a song within an album. Um, when you're doing a single, you don't have any anything that you has to fit with or reference with. So as far as the EQing, compression, limiting side of mastering a single, it's a little different in that I'm just trying to make that thing sound as great as it can. Um, whether it needs a lot of processing or if it just needs a little bit of harmonic detail added and a limiter. Whatever's going to make it sound great, that's what I'm going to do. However, we might put that song into an album next, and in context of that album, I may have to add a few dB more limiting than I would like. 
and a little less limiting than I would really like on another song so that they end up averaging out to roughly the same level and more importantly, the same feel. Um, the place that I, I use compression in mastering the most is, is not trying to gain level. I hear people talking about using compression for gaining level and anytime I'm compressing enough to get anything useful, half dB or even a dB more level out, uh, it usually sounds compressed to me, and I'm hearing the, the kick and the snare get manipulated. Um, so usually when I'm doing going in and actually doing some compression that I can hear, it's because I'm working on an album, and four of the songs are beefier than this one, and I can't remove that beef. You know, dynamic heft is what I'm kind of talking about, and we've got one song that sounds thinner. I can't go and remove that, that dynamic heft from those without fucking them up. We could do it with a uh, expander if we had to or a, a upwards expander, like a decompressor. But it's much easier to add a little bit of compression to this other song to make it match those, and more than likely that's what the client's gonna prefer anyway. Um, so yeah, in mastering in an album context, I'm not just trying to make each song sound great on its own, you're trying to make it sound great in reference to each other, like they fit together. Um, depending on how it was recorded and mixed, that part might be 100% easy. There may be no work to do in that, rel in that realm. Um, although, I, most of the albums I end up mastering these days were not... They didn't do a lot of pre-production, meaning they didn't sit down and go, okay, we're gonna record these songs, we're gonna record them in this way, so we get this result. Usually, it's more of an experimental thing. We've got songs, we're in a studio, let's start recording. Um, and then we end up with eight songs that sound like the same band, but each song has its own texture and its own feel and its own dynamic weight and heft like I was talking about before. So when it comes time to mastering it, we're not only trying to make sure they feel the same loudness, which meters can help with. An LUFS meter doesn't help very much for, for leveling out an album because of the example I gave before about one song being loud the whole time and one being song loud, song being quiet the whole time except for 30 loud seconds. LUFS levels are pretty much worthless in, in leveling out different songs on an album. Um, an RMS meter, that's, that's slowed down to like three to five, maybe 10 seconds, can help in leveling out an album. But because of frequency response also affecting perce perceived loudness, you can get something that looks really loud on a meter or really quiet on a meter, but when you're comparing it to the other songs in the album, it sounds correct and it sounds like the right loudness. So, um, once again, when you're doing a single, it's, it's, I'm, depending on the client, I might be making it as loud as it can go before it starts to distort. Maybe even pushing it a little farther than that if that's what they're wanting me to do. And making it generally sound as good as I can while also doing that for them. Um, but in an album, I, there's compromises that have to be made. Um, usually I, I kind of listen to the, the most of the songs all the way through, or I'm sorry, I listen to all the songs most of the way through and um, kind of come up with the song that I think feels the best to me. Best mix, it sounds the greatest, it's the closest to being finished. And I'll master that first. Sometimes, by the way, that'll be dictated by the, the client as well, if they've got a single that they're putting out. They usually want that one to be that song, the benchmark song. So I'll we'll master that one first. And then as I'm doing the rest of the songs, I'm constantly calling back to that first one to make sure they still fit. And then as I go on with the album, I'm calling back and recalling, listening in reference to the entire album before I print a track, make sure that it's gonna fit there. Um, and sometimes I'll be getting to the point where I'm editing the album together and one song is, it doesn't fit. I, I didn't, there's something I didn't notice originally and it just doesn't, it's either sounds quieter than the song before it or after it now or something like that. Um, and in those cases, I might have to go back and, and add, uh, either do a little more processing to make it fit or do a little less processing to make it fit. Um, so that's the main difference between singles and, and albums is that a single is, is stands on its own. It's in reference to itself. Whereas in an album, you have multiple songs that need to feel like they originally were supposed to fit together, um, whether that was part of the original production process or not. Thank you so much, Warren, for such a wonderful interview. It's a huge honor to have you on my YouTube channel. Um, once I get the new studio set up here and uh, uh, get back to, to regular life again after last year, I'll let you know. Maybe we can do this again. All right? Take it easy, man. Talk to you soon. 
Don't forget to check out Warren's courses on Promix Academy and Produce Like a Pro Academy. See you next time.